thank you for that introduction. I'm not sure I'm going to talk about hope or fear or technology, but hope perhaps we could we could draw some threads into um, into that um, from what I've got to say. I certainly think that the the material allows a, a pretty broad discussion. So hopefully other people can pick up those threads um, and throw me difficult questions about hope and fear and technology. So uh, as uh, Neil said, I actually do have a copy of the book, so I can. I can wave it around. Don't drop it on your toe, though, because it's a bit heavy. Um, and actually, I'd recommend the PDF version for traveling. I, I carried it to London with me last week and <laughs> don't want to do that again. Um, so I thought I'd share some of the insights and um, some of my thoughts about what it might mean for a future election. And then obviously answer, answer questions in a discussion. So I've waved it around. Here is, here is the cover of the book. And I, I know from Twitter, a lot of people have said they don't like the cover of the book for various reasons. The option to cover it in um, wallpaper um, doesn't have to be a hundred pound a roll um, in order to hide the, uh, the cover is of course available. <coughs> Excuse me. So the book was written with, with three co-authors. Um, it was already mentioned, Professor Tim Bale, uh, Rob Phil Ford from Manchester and Will Jennings at Southampton. So it's very much a collective effort and even some of the chapters are written by other um, contributors as well. So some of the things I'm gonna show you and some of the um, claims that I might make are based on other people's research as well as my own. So uh, some of the details might be sketchy in some places. The framework that we think is most important for understanding the 2019 election, so two years on, um, is BBC, Brexit, Boris and Corbyn, although I don't like calling him Boris, so I will probably refer to Boris Johnson and Johnson, but it messes up the BBC acronym when I do that. Um, and these three things were really important in the run up to the election, in the election campaign and in the outcome. But what I'll also try and argue, and again, it might be something to, to talk about more in questions, is that each of these three factors were themselves the product of long-term forces. None of these things occurred out of the blue, although they may have appeared to do so at the time. So to cast us back to the heady days of the 2017 to 2019 parliament, this is a chart of all the polling that took place between those, between those two elections. And you can see there's a period of um, relative stability. I mean, relative compared with what was to come, stability <laughs> through to the end of um, 2018. And then from the beginning of 2019, I think I've described this elsewhere as a kind of roller coaster of polling because at one point between um, May and July, a Brexit party, Lib Dems, Labour and the Conservatives all led in at least one poll. So it was a real kind of roller coaster and anything could have happened. Um, the arrival of the Brexit party on the scene really shook things up in the run up to the to the European elections that they didn't want to happen, but also gave them their platform in a kind of slightly ironic way. Um, the collapse of the Conservative vote as that Brexit party vote grew the kind of arrival and disappearance of Change UK in that period, uh, a brief arrival and rapid disappearance. And then the relative strength of the Lib Dems, which faded away um, in the second half of the year. It was kind of already starting to wane as they won the um, by-election, Bre Bre Brecon, I can't remember the full title, I'm really bad with names, um, but the Brecon by-election, was the kind of high point really of, of the Lib Dem support. And we can see from this chart that as soon as Boris Johnson, in fact, even slightly before Boris Johnson replaces Theresa May, as soon as it's obvious that he's going to, the Brexit party support starts to fall and the Conservative part support starts to rise. And it just continues to rise then from July of 2019 right through to the end of the year. And you can see that happening also in this chart, which charts um, who people said would make the best prime minister over the period. So immediately after the 2017 election, 
Um, Theresa May and Jeremy Corbyn were relatively close in terms of who people thought would make the best prime minister. After um, the various meaningful votes, Theresa May started to fall, and but Jeremy Corbyn was falling all the way through that period as well as to who would make the best prime minister. And as soon as Boris Johnson becomes prime minister, this gap opens up again. Now, some people have talked about that as if Boris Johnson was somehow a uniquely popular politician. We still hear that at the moment. And what this data shows is that that's a bit of a myth. Um, I think one of the best things about these books, having been a kind of a reader, consumer of them, um, of the previous volumes, is their ability to, to bust some of the myths around elections. And the idea that Boris Johnson was a uniquely popular leader is one of those myths. So the dotted lines here are the popularity of Theresa May in blue, Jeremy Corbyn in red during the 2017 campaign. And then the solid lines are Boris Johnson in blue, Jeremy Corbyn again in red in the 2019 campaign. Sorry, I'm just gonna have to minimize everybody <laughs> so that I can see the ends of the lines. Um, and what we can see here is that at the end of the 2019 campaign, so on polling day in 2019, on average, Boris Johnson was less popular than Jeremy Corbyn had been in 2017. So this idea that he's a uniquely popular politician doesn't really hold up um, to scrutiny. However, in 29, by 2019, Jeremy Corbyn's popularity had sunk to really, really low levels. So that although Boris Johnson was less popular than Jeremy Corbyn had been in 2017, he was much more popular than Jeremy Corbyn in 2019. So not a uniquely popular um, politician, but much more popular than the opposition at the time. I'm going to move on. So that is a, a kind of quick overview of some of the data around the, the Boris Johnson B and the Corbyn C. The, the other B there is Brexit. And I want to just come on to that now. I mean, you, you might have missed the slogan of the election, possibly if you spent the entirety of the campaign in bed. But obviously the campaign was set up around get Brexit done. And this resonated with the electorate who were fed up with the parliamentary shenanigans, with the votes, with things dragging on and on and on. Even some of those who had voted to remain and wanted to remain were simply fed up with it carrying on and on and on and wanted to talk about something else. So this was a slogan that really, really resonated. And in a way that Theresa May had had her three word slogan in 2017, strong and stable, where in the way that that one didn't, didn't cut through, it didn't have the resonance with the voters, get Brexit done, really, really did. <clears throat> Excuse me. And if we look at how Leave and Remain voters then voted, we can see the impact that Brexit had. It's by no means a perfect match. So I think that's important. But the Leave vote coalesced for the Conservatives. They won 74% of Leave voters. Whereas the Remain vote opted for the Labour Party as a majority, it did fragment a little bit. One of the factors, one of the things here that's really, really worth noting and really worth thinking about for where politics might go next is the 25% of Remain voters who actually voted Conservative. So this is not some kind of perfect realignment. We've still got 25% of the Remain vote voting Conservative, which if we'd been fully realigned, we wouldn't expect to happen. And these, of course, in large part, are the voters in the now um, so-called blue wall. I don't like the red wall term. I, I, don't, I like the blue wall one even less because it's not even a wall. <clears throat> but those voters that people think now are vulnerable to switching from the Conservative Party to another party. The Lib Dems had really hoped that they would be able to win those votes in 2019. Two things, I think, stopped that happening. One was the revoke policy 
that the Lib Dems adopted. Some of those softer Remain voters saw that as problematic and potentially undemocratic. Although I think that was a lesser factor than the fact that for those Remain voters, those conservative Remain voters, their dislike of Jeremy Corbyn was stronger than their um, desire for Britain to remain in the EU. So those two factors rubbed against each other. Um, and I think in the end, um, Corbyn's Labour were a really big scare factor for those voters. Um, and they stayed with the Conservatives for that reason. But a story, even if every Remain voter and every Leave voter had been perfectly aligned, Labour would still have been behind because of the distribution of the votes. So the Remain vote is more concentrated in constituencies and the Leave vote is more evenly spread. So it makes it easier to win more constituencies with the Leave vote than it does with the Remain vote. But Labour weren't even close to um, gra grabbing all of that Remain vote. There's a chunk with the Conservatives um, and a chunk with the Liberal Democrats, a, a smaller, smaller group with the Greens, obviously. I want to just now run through some of the big trends of the election. One of the things we've been able to do, a kind of innovation with the book based compared with earlier volumes, is we've been able to dig into some of the individual voting data. So there are a number of chapters which draw on the elite interviews with interviews with the key actors, with MPs, party staff, and so on. Um, but we've also introduced some analysis of the voters themselves, um, partly, partly because it reflects our own interests <laughs> and our own skill set, um, partly because when these books were first um, written, it was very hard to do this. Data took a very, very long time to come out after it had been collected. We live in a world where data is available much more quickly, so we we're able to include analysis like this in, in the book in a way that hasn't been done before. So again, if you were paying any attention to the election or particularly, I think, to the commentary about the election afterwards, you will have come across this, this term, the red wall. And I don't know how familiar people are with that. And if people want me to explain in any more detail what it means, I'm very happy to do so. These two charts, however, they look at voters who were in all other constituencies and voters in the Red Wall constituencies. And you can see during the period from the 2015 election, and actually we don't have the sample size to track back further, but if you were able to track back to the 2010 election, I think you, you would see even, even wider um, gaps in these lines. So the Conservatives were doing better nationally than they were in the Red Wall and Labour are doing better in the Red Wall than they were doing nationally. But over this period, those gaps have been closing. And in particular, the Conservative Party have been doing increasingly well in these seats to the point where they're almost the same as their national level um, by the time we get to 2019. There is something really important in these charts though, and that's the fact that the lines basically track each other. So it's not the case that these red wall voters were behaving very, very differently to the national picture. They were just at a different level, um, largely due to the composition of these seats. Just going back a step um, in the story there, though, we can see that this gap closed between 2015 and 2017. So although it was seen as a disastrous election in many ways for Theresa May in 2017, actually, she was already knocking some of the cement out of the red wall, that some of those bricks had already been well and truly loosened um, before Boris Johnson came along. And in fact, I suspect Theresa May will never quite get the credit she deserves for the fact that she was able to make that progress in those seats, um, just because they didn't quite topple. An awful lot of those majorities had been really, really shrunk down to enable that one final kick at the wall to push it over. I also wanted to show you, so I'm just moving myself around on the screen so I can see the chart. Um, the, one of the thing, other things I wanted to show you was some of the long-term trends that were in effect at this election, because I think one of the really important factors is that we see, we see 
two party leaders and we see Brexit and we think of everything as being in that sort of narrow period from 2016 to 2021. But a lot of these things have been happening for a while. So this was the end of a process that had been going on. Um, sometimes dis sort of describe it as an election, at least a decade in the making, because all these things, all these forces had been coming into alignment for some time. This chart's a bit, a little bit complicated. I don't think I would normally display it like this, but sometimes in the book, you've got to kind of get an awful lot of information onto one chart. So this is the conservative labor vote margin um, in the under 45s, which is the darker line and the over 45 and overs, which is the lighter line. Now, if we look up into about 2001, maybe even 2000, maybe even 2010, these lines are roughly following each other. Again, at slightly different levels, but roughly moving in the same direction. The Labour lead over the Conservatives, which are the negative numbers, was as high in 1997 and 2001 as it was in 2017 and greater than it was in 2019. So this lead for Labour amongst the young is not necessarily something we could think of as a new phenomenon. It's something that was present when Labour was doing well previously. However, when they were doing well previously in 97 and 2001, they also had a lead amongst the over 45s. They lost that lead in 2005 and they have never been able to recover it. Um, and I think that's re a really important new fact, new um, dimension to our politics. After the 2017 election, I spent hours with data sets trying to, in modeling terms, destroy the effect of age on voting behavior. Nothing I have ever been able to measure and put in a model explains that phenomenon, that, that new age phenomenon. So that's something we might want to pick up. Um, and you can see here that in 2019, the conservatives had a huge advantage in the 45 and overs. Um, a really massive advantage, bigger than bigger than they'd ever had before. Now, if if you follow me on Twitter, um, you will have seen this chart before, probably more than once. You may even have seen my lovely animated version of it, which doesn't quite work on a PowerPoint slide, um, but the, which I'm very very proud of. Um, this is a a way of looking at how the political values of Labour and Conservative voters have changed over time. So what I've created is a two-dimensional value space. And I, I use this a lot in my writing. I use this a lot in my thinking. In fact, I don't, I don't think I can think in any other way anymore. And um, along the horizontal axis, we have a measure which taps into economic left-right. So it measures things like attitudes to redistribution, there's an item, um, there's one law for the rich and one law for the poor, which taps into all sorts of interesting things around COVID. Um, what are the others? Big business have too much power. They're the items that are on that scale. And it's very much what you would traditionally think of as, as left, right in politics. And then on the vertical axis, we have a scale which I've spent far too much of my life trying to think of a name for, um, but, we, <laughs> but which, I prefer to use liberal authoritarian to describe. Some people like to use um, liberal conservative, but I don't like that for, not only because it makes writing about it very difficult because you have to talk about conservative conservatives and non-conservative conservatives and it sounds ridiculous, but also because it tends to lead people to think that there are items on things like abortion and gay marriage in the scale and there aren't. So the scale measures things like young people don't have enough respect for traditional values, um, children should be taught to obey authority, has an item, excuse me, on whether or not public protest should be allowed. Um, this particular version doesn't have an item on the death penalty, but, but in most versions of it, it does have that item. Um, and what I've plotted on the chart is the, is the mean position of Labour and Conservative voters at each, each election since 1992 on those two scales. So first of all, we should, we should knock on the head any, 
any idea that left right in economic terms doesn't mean anything in British politics anymore because the conservative voters are clearly to the right of the Labour voters and there's clear blue waters or at least clear white chart between the two groups all the way through. The Labour Party voters have been moving, and we, this isn't telling anybody anything they don't really know already know, but has been moving down into that bottom left quadrant, which is the most left wing and the most liberal positions. Um, and that's been happening primarily since 2015. And it's kind of accelerated down and down into that corner, moved even further in 2019 um, than it did between 2015 and 2017. For the Labour Party, people often ask me, well, how, how do the, the Labour Party win votes back? We don't want to talk to all, all these um, authoritarian, racist, bigoted voters, to coin a phrase. Um, what I would say is this chart suggests actually you don't have to, because the average position of the Conservative Party voters in 2015, 2017 and 2019 is the same as Labour Party voters in 2001 and 2010. You don't have to move all the way to the top of the chart there in order to, to be able to talk to some additional voters. And so those are the two things really that I think are important in, in understanding this chart. And I could talk about values till tomorrow. So if you get me started on that one, you might never stop me. Two final, oh, sorry, I've got to move myself back across now so I can see the chart again, <laughs> moving myself around the screen. Two last charts that I want to show you because it's all very well measuring the levels of, of all Conservative voters and all Labour Party voters. But what really matters in an election are the voters that move around. They're what make the difference between who wins and who loses, not the voters that stay put. So the, the next two charts are models of two groups of Labour voters. The first of those that went from Labour to the Conservatives and the second are the ones that went from Labour to, to another Remain party. These, these models have pretty much every demographic control you can think of in them, but I'm only showing you the bits here that are really interesting. All the other figures are below 5%. So in terms of the chance of switching from Labour to the Conservatives, Boris Johnson was a significant pull factor. If, you, if people liked Boris Johnson, they were really very likely to switch from Labour to Conservative. So 2017 voters liked Boris Johnson, they were really very likely to switch. There's much less evidence here that, that Corbyn was a push factor, um, doesn't make a lot of difference. And some people have interpreted this to say, well, actually, Boris Johnson was more important than how they'd voted in the referendum. And in modelling terms, that's correct. But the reason some of these voters liked Boris Johnson was because he was seen as iconic of the Leave campaign. And so some of that effect is kind of working through him as, as a sort of personification of the Leave campaign. This also, I think, adds another dimension to the chart I showed you earlier, which was um, saying Johnson's not a particularly popular politician. Um, he was popular amongst some groups of voters. Um, some people describe him as the, as the kind of Heineken politician that can reach the parts others can't. And I think that is probably true, but there's a danger there as well, because actually if you start to lose some of that shine, um, things could rapidly collapse. Sorry, I'm, I'm taking up far much too, too much time and you all need to get off to watch Everton. Um, so <laughs> I've already got one more chart. <laughs> and this one is switching from Labour to another Remain party. And this is where Corbyn comes back into our story, because as well as helping to keep some of those Conservative Remain voters fixed with the Conservatives, people who didn't like Jeremy Corbyn were particularly likely to switch to another Remain party. So it was also driving some of that switching to the Liberal Democrats, to the Greens, to the, to the Unite, Unite to Remain parties. So the leaders were both really important in understanding vote switching. I haven't got time to go into it now, but I would argue in a, in a, in a longer piece that the, the long-term changes, the structural changes in values, in age, in other education, which I haven't touched on here, 
were in part responsible for those parties getting those leaders at that time. And so I think there's a long term story to tell about how we ended up with an election that was Boris Johnson versus Jeremy Corbyn in the first place, and not just a kind of epiphenomenal story about leaders themselves. So some quick thoughts about where that might, where that might go next. First of all, I still think politics is a little bit in sort of suspended animation. I'm not really sure we, we, we haven't had normal politics for nearly two years and I'm not sure what it's gonna look like when we do get it again. But let's 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 have a go. Um, this is where this isn't based. This isn't based on data. This is me just speculating. First of all, I think it's dangerous for a person who was elected to get Brexit done to continue to fight a forever war with the EU because that's just constantly reminding people that Brexit isn't done, um, or at least not fully. So we've seen some rowing back over the last couple of weeks three or four weeks on um, the Northern Ireland Protocol, seems some backing off a little bit on some of the stuff on with, with France and the channel crossings. I don't know how it's gonna play out, but it doesn't seem me to me to be sensible to keep telling people Brexit isn't fully done um, when you were elected to get it done. On leadership, Johnson was definitely a pull factor for some groups but it wasn't especially popular. And I really wonder what happens to that vote when some of the shine comes off. They weren't necessarily natural conservatives and they don't have conservative party loyalty of any kind. So what might happen to those voters, where they might go is still very much up in the air. Um, and for Labour, there were these long-term issues reflected in Brexit and Corbyn's leadership. And I think Labour, many people within the Labour Party thought it was one or other of those things. And once those things had gone away, Labour would bounce back. It was much more complicated than that. And both of those things were symptoms as well as causes. And that's why Labour didn't bounce back as quickly as they might have hoped. Um, and that's the end. I'll stop sharing, then I can see more people. <laughs>